didn't have to say that. I was told that it was. I said, you don't have to say shit when they record it. And I got dialysis, so I, I'm waiting for them to call me in. So uh, if I had too much to eat or drink, I could get some of that off. So I'm just glad about that. Oh, hi, Ted Timothy. How are you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What? I got COVID? No, I don't have COVID. Why would I have COVID? Maybe somebody in here might have had COVID. I mean, you putting me in isolation in a dialysis center? Why would you be doing that when I, I don't have COVID? I didn't have COVID. I didn't even, what you mean? What? I had a test. I, you was told that I have COVID? COVID-19? No, maybe I might be got it from somebody in here because I don't go anywhere. I'm in the house all the time. I'm in the house all day. I only go to dialysis and back, dialysis and back. So how could I could have contracted that? And then now you're going to put me in isolation, put me away from everybody else. I'm feeling some kind of way about that. You know, I understand about safety and stuff like that, but I'm just saying, where could I have gotten it from? I don't know. That's bugging me. That's bothering me. I, I, I'm going to call that advocate up. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm feel, I'm, I, I don't like this. I'm feeling some kind of way, you know, because um, <clears throat> this is the Lisa Baxter show giving you the 411 in the kidney world. Hi, guys. How are you doing? How are you doing? Happy Sunday. And I hope your Thanksgiving was wonderful and fantabulous. I know mine was pretty good. I was inside and I did some cooking. I only was responsible for two dishes with potato salad. And it was a uh, sweet potato pie. That's all. So uh, let me show you a few things before I introduce my guest. This is, I, I love this thing because it's a squeegee thing to get your stress off and stuff like that. I remember getting these before at Fresenius. All right. So, you know, you can work some of that stress out. And I love my awareness bracelet that I would keep and put on. And every time somebody saw it, it gave me a chance to spread kidney awareness to other people. So get your bracelet if you don't got it. I even had some made for the Lisa Baxter show years ago, because, you know, I've had the show for nine years. And uh, let me see what else I got. Oh, I had to show you this. You know how your ears be bothering you when you be having your mask on. I don't know about you, but when I be having my mask and stuff on, the ears start bothering me. It makes my ears point out like this and it start rubbing. I haven't been starting to get a rash on my face. Well, anyway, this goes in the back of the mask and it fits nicely in the back. So it'll be around your head instead of around the ear part. So you'd still get the, the uh, safety of all of this. So isn't that something? Um, you know, I'm I'm a, a ambassador with AAKP, and they gave me this. Isn't that cute? I just love it, love it, love it. Mm -hmm. How about you? Well, you know, I'm always playing with you guys about the gloves because I collect all kind of gloves as long as it really protects me. So I got my white, I got my blue, I got my turquoise, and I got my green. Uh, that's right, green. All right. I had a crazy scare this week because I always do my uh, medication for transplant on a Saturday so I can fix everything up and have it done. And usually if a, a pill body, bottle is empty, I turn it upside down to remind me. But when I put it on the dresser, I put something in front of it and didn't see it. So when it got closer, uh, I had ran low and out of cell set. So, you know, I called the pharmacy. He said he couldn't bring it. He'll bring it the next day. But I did have one dose. And then I had to call my doctor, my primary, who was also my nephrologist. And he said, Lisa, don't worry. You'll be all right. You haven't did this before. You know, in, as smart as you could be and as hard as you can work, you can mess up or do something wrong. So I, I like to always come clean on the show and tell you guys the truth. Because when you see us, you might think we're perfect, excuse me, but we aren't. And we might not do nothing wrong, but we do. And, and even with the best intentions. And I'm usually on point and on my game and everything like that. I apologize to you about the screen. I've been trying to fix that for weeks and nothing I've done has fixed that yet. But don't you worry. We're getting better and better at this thing. Much love, much peace. All right. Let me introduce my guest because I've been jabbered, jabbered, and jabbered some more. All right. Man, I got the person of persons here for you to annoy. That's right. I got Dawn. Kirkowski, right? All right. She's a kidney warrior. 
Uh, she's a, um, a transplant mentor, a health therapist. She's a social worker. She's a clinical social worker. All right. Um, uh, she has a radio and a TV uh, film. She's going to tell you more about that, but I'm just saying she has so many things going on, some stuff that she took at the university. She used even for her her uh, her transplant and her, her dialysis mission and stuff. You know, you got to incorporate this stuff sometimes. Man, she's married. She's a wife, okay? She's a warrior goddess, a warrior princess around. She's a woman with a mission. And I would like to introduce her to the show. Y'all saw her around on the other shows. She's family. Come on, Dawn. Woohoo! What? Do I got to say that again? Woohoo! Welcome, welcome. How nice you doing? Nice to see you. Good. How are you? Nice to see you. I'm good. I'm alive and kicking. I mean, we've been chatting on the chats on the different shows and stuff like that. And then you and I have been talking on the, you know, on the phone and everything. So it's just nice to have you on this show. Nice to know your story. I wanted somebody else to hear and know your story. And you're going to tell that thing tonight about that. Absolutely. Yes. Lisa. Right? Right. Yes, yes. So we're going to get this ball sliding in and rolling. And I would like to ask you, okay, we're going to talk about what is it that you do? What is your job, your job title? What is it you do for a living? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I am a uh, mental health clinician, uh, which mm -hmm. basically means that I do assessments for people with mental health issues. Uh, right now during COVID, my work has been a little bit expanded into helping people deal with the stress of COVID-19, anything from financial to losses. Uh, I work for an agency for an urgent care mental health center. So uh, it's a 30 day program for people in crisis, which helps people so they don't have to go to the hospital necessarily, and they can get their medications. They can get seen by either a nurse practitioner or a doctor. Uh, we can provide them with resources, which I do quite often provide resources in the community and uh, basically do many things that are not necessarily in the social work title from resources to finding people support groups to just about everything. Uh, I'm a licensed LCSW in New Jersey and um, basically provide mental health services uh, to people. Sometimes I have patients who are uh, who have kidney disease, so I help them too. Uh, I use many of the things that happen to me to help my clients, whether it be resources for kidney disease or eye disease or anything I've experienced, um, I, I basically will give to my clients. Wow. Wow. Now that's what I'm talking about. Now that's what I'm talking about. That is great. That is fantastic. So you're a clinical social worker. Yeah. And you're a therapist. And right. I mean, those are double jobs, dual jobs there. And you also battle, uh, you have your own illness going on at the same time. Um, is your, work, your workload uh, heavy or hard? Because I know being a social worker myself and, you know, dealing with uh, being was on dialysis, transplant and everything, sometimes things got a little heavy. Well, like social workers know, the paperwork is the heaviest part. Uh, not literally anymore because everything's in the computer. Uh, so we don't have to pick up the heavy charts anymore, but still uh, back to back to back <laughs> clients lately. Uh, it's just gotten busier during COVID and the crisis and all the financial and all the and all the hardship out there and all the political stress. It's just been uh, massively crazy where you feel like you can't breathe when you're in your office. So you have to remember to take care of yourself being also a kidney patient. Wow. Were you working from home? Uh, no, but it was the closest thing to it. I, w I was isolated in an office. 
um, where my employers felt that it, it was safe. Uh, one of the problems for me with going home to uh, do work is I have conditions in my office set up for somebody who's blind and visually impaired. And it would have taken a while for the IT department to transfer all that to my home. So I sit there with the door locked all day or shut pretty much, except for lunch. Wow. And I just, uh, and it's hard because there's no windows. So sometimes it feels a little isolating. So I have to at least go say hi to the secretaries. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. I, I was in one, my, one of the sites, my main site. I'm in my own office and we will all spread it out into our own offices. So you can hear us yelling to, you know, each office to one another or calling on the phone or, you know, speaker or something like that. So I know place now that I'm in an office by myself, but I'm close by somebody else's office and clients mm -hmm. do come in and I have to, you know, put them further back. You know, they come in with children or it's like whole mm -hmm. families that I service. So I, mm -hmm. I, I do. So I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm glad that you're able to, you know, going because sometimes with you know certain uh illnesses we're at risk with a lot of things i know one of the people that deal with um our job with you know with how clean everything is he said lisa what are you doing here you're at risk you need to go and you know you need to maybe go work remotely back home and everything and i was home a long time with everybody else that was home but i just i'm just there to help another program out but anyway now uh, now talk, I would like uh, you to tell us about your kidney. You have a very interesting kidney journey. So hit us up with that story, please. Okay. This goes back to okay. when I was in my twenties and right now I'm 49. So I've had my transplant now, uh, September 6th of this year, of, uh, this year was a 20 year transplant, but going back when I started with kidney disease, uh, I was about 24, 25, and I was told I had 50% of kidney function left. So that was quite a shock. Uh, basically, by the time I was on, I was uh, 26, um, I was uh, basically on dialysis. Uh, it was pretty hard for me to accept, though. I really had a difficulty uh, accepting it because I was so young. That was the hardest part for me. Um, I had a, a doctor say to me, well, you're going to need dialysis and we need to list you for a transplant. And um, he said, which type of dialysis do you want? I said, neither. <laughs> so I ended up getting pretty sick to my stomach and trying a pill he gave me that ended up giving me something called tort torticolitis, which is kind of like Tourette's syndrome, uh, before I was willing to go on dialysis. So I basically ran back to him and said, hey, I just got too sick. Uh, where's the dialysis? Even though I didn't really want it. That kind of was uh, what kind of brought me out of my denial. So um, I was on peritoneal dialysis for uh, two and a half years uh, is how I started dialysis. And I know a lot of people start with hemodialysis. They don't start with peritoneal, but I was very lucky because I had great providers who suggested it because I was working. So I pretty much worked almost the whole time was when I was on uh, dialysis. I was very lucky. Uh, after I got peritonitis after two and a half years, uh, I did have to switch to hemo. I did in center. Um, there was not really a lot of promotion at the time, uh, for home dialysis. And I lived in a tiny studio apartment by myself. So that was really not going to be an option. I was lucky that I got through doing PD by myself and lifting the boxes and doing all of that stuff and still working a job. So, uh, basically when I was on hemo eight months, I had a lot of trouble getting an access. Uh, so one of the things that happened, and I know Steve talks about larger veins and, uh, different things, but I have very tiny veins. So they tried to do an access in my arm with both a shunt and a graft. Uh, neither one of them were going to work. So they left the catheter in and I was very lucky because eight months later, uh, I did get a transplant. Turned out that the kidney disease I had ran in the family with just one person. My mom was going to be a living donor and basically she couldn't because she also found out that she had FSGS, focal segmental glomerulonephritis sclerosis, were the only two uh, lucky ones in the family there. Uh, I say that very sarcastically, but you know, hey, uh, we're both still here. So, um, 
and we've met and and we've met wonderful people through the journey so i can't say it's all been bad um that's the gift i got after i got kidney disease is meeting such fabulous people including lisa baxter here and and a lot of other people uh, especially recently um so it has gifted me a little bit there um also uh after that uh, my oh. nephrologist it has been a blessing in every single way because i've had her over 20 years as well so wow now you were on peritoneal what yes. was the plus and minuses of you being on peritoneal okay so peritoneal gave me the freedom to work first of all which is why a doctor even mentioned it to me i was already working full time I was commuting between, I guess it was a good hour and a half because I don't drive to go to my job, subways and trains. I really don't remember how I, how on earth I did this um, while I was sick, even before I started dialysis and I was sick to my stomach on the trains. And then basically uh, peritoneal gave me the freedom to work. I also had a, per, had a boss there at this one job that actually set up a room so I can do uh, PD using the IV, IV pole, ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. So that ended up being great for quite a while. Um, then I had some problems with the tubing, of course, and I ended up doing the cycler. Um, that had in its advantages because you didn't have to do anything during the day, but that was great. But the disadvantages that is terrible to sleep with, you hardly get any sleep. I, I agree with people who say that the tube twist, I laid on the tube, the machine beeped. I was late for work because I had to get everything done in the morning. It was just uh, absolutely uh, crazy. Uh, the thing is you have to do it yourself and uh, and you just have to be to so clean about it that it it's like, even if you are, you still risk peritonitis um, and other things right, could go wrong. Huh, I'm sorry? I said, yeah. you had to be downright sterile. I had two siblings that dealt um, with um, peritoneal and oh, yeah. my brother, Keith, he, he had uh, he pulled this one night mistake. And my sister, D. Simone, she loved it. Oh, that went on for a good minute. She had to, she taught all of us how to do it, especially <laughs> her grandchildren. Wow. And she had a cat and a dog, wow. and God knows we didn't want her to have the cat and dog, but she had it, and she got uh, peritonitis as well, and then she got it so bad that you know she had to she had to get hemodialysis, but she had bad veins. Out of all of my siblings, she was the only one that I mean, yeah, out of seven of us that was on dialysis, she was the only one that had the bad veins, and they had to create one from her taking a vein out of a leg you know, putting it in her arm and, and building it and stuff like that. So I, you know, I, I saw the plus and minuses of it. I, that wasn't my, you know, my, I didn't want it when it was offered to me to be home or go home. I'm a center mm -hmm. person. So that was your yeah. plus and minuses when it came to have PD at home besides getting peritonitis. What was yeah. the, the plus and minuses yeah. of having hemo going in center? Um, I'd say mostly hemo was more of a minus than a plus in some ways, uh, basically because I had to make, I was also working then and I had to get out make sure I got out of the job a certain time. And, uh, I was working at somebody's administration assistant back then. It was a different job. Uh, of course, however, the boss was really great and, uh, he would say, you know, it's three o'clock. You got to go. You got to be at the center. Uh, he'd actually remind me to get out of the <laughs> building and go. So he was pretty cool. Uh, ended up becoming a friend, him and his wife. So that's pretty cool. Um, basically, um, is, I think the one thing that I'd say was, that was an advantage for me was that there was a, the dietitian and the social worker were right there, even though they were busy, they were right there to ask questions. I didn't need to ask a whole lot of questions because I pretty much got educated myself. Um, since uh, Dome I kind of had to, yes, I kind of had to. The other thing was support. Uh, I love talking to the other patients, uh, there. I love talking to the other dialysis people who would listen and encouraging them and vice versa. And they became friends. I mean, there was one guy there, just some um, guy from that was of Puerto Rican descent, Papi Chulo. I remember him fondly. Unfortunately, he did pass a heart attack. But, pass you know, heart attack. 
but that's okay because you know what it was a pleasure to know him in the time that i did and he was like everybody's like everybody's friend and and papa that's why they called him that uh and then i made other friends like one of the technicians there ricky okay ricky was cute i'm gonna say this that ricky was just so cute he was a doll uh i enjoyed it when he was my tech but the best thing about ricky is that he recognized because i was young that i was bored and he used to bring me puzzles to do uh like on paper and little games and things that were out of a book because the tv was so boring uh back then they only had like 13 channels of garbage on there was no cable in the center we didn't have <laughs> iphones okay so you all that have your iphone and your ipad when you go in the center you're very lucky <laughs> So, uh, you know, I think that was about the, I mean, the best thing about in center. I mean, then, then occasionally my doctor would come in and my kidney doctor, like I said, she's been there every step of the way to help me make decisions. In fact, she was the one that said, don't take her catheter out. Don't mess with her arm or her leg any further. I have a feeling she's going to get uh, transplanted soon. So basically I got lucky and blessed and I did end up with a, a wonderful kidney donor, deceased donor whom in my journey, I actually know who she is now. And if perchance you're watching, uh, you know, I love you, Yvette Vargas, because your sister is my hero. Um, that's what I get to say wow. about that one. Wow. Now, hey, don't let, don't let me not let you want to say something to your donor. I, I'm going to be quiet and let you say it. I'm, I want you to have the screen to yourself if you want to say anything special. I ain't mad at you. I don't know mine. <laughs> mine had passed away. But her son, I was able to write a letter to. So if you want to say something to your donor, I mean, I can shoot these questions right now for a minute. And then you go, that's a beautiful, you know yours. Wow. Well, I basically, I'll tell you the story how that happened. I was, it was like I was blessed twice because I went, when I went to social work school and I just started my first, my second internship for my master's, I was working in a hospital. I guess they didn't realize where to deliver where to deliver the letter to from the organ procurement organization. Um, so they delivered a letter there, and this was five years post transplant that I got a response from all the letters that I sent her. I didn't intend necessarily to send letters to necessarily meet her, although I was hoping I could. Um, but I, when I got uh, transplanted, I sent her pictures and and uh different things uh like i sent her pictures of my wedding i sent her a copy of my graduation from my master's degree i wanted her to, her to see that her 19 year old sister did not die in vain so i sent her everything i could possibly send her to say this is what dawn ceruto kirkowski is doing with her life and i know that your sister you know can't but she lives through me and this is what i'm doing and i give back by making a difference and that was why I became a social worker, basically. Um, so I got this letter while I was in social work school. And I was just like so glad. It was the first contact with her uh, saying who the sister of the donor was. And then she sent me some Christmas cards a few years later. Um, now we're on Facebook and we um, contact each other via Facebook or Messenger or email. And we've exchanged some pictures. And uh, it's, it, it's just a whole nother blessing to know her for um 15 years now it's been that i know who she is and a little by little about her family and a little bit about my donor i have pictures of my donor now and i i just think it's absolutely wonderful that they reached out to me wow but i know they usually keep that a secret or you know keep it under wraps so i was able to uh excuse me investigate that and and, and get that wonderful Woo, un under the cover information. Okay, so I didn't really research it. The organ procurement agency lets you um, write letters uh, and kind of with just your first name and you put kidney transplant or whatever transplant you had uh, basically to the family. But then I wrote a letter saying, uh, I would like to know who you are. I would love to meet you if it were possible. And it, I think it was because I wrote copious letters and sent copious pictures. I mean, I was sort of uh, about once a month sending them something because it was just to me a mission to let them know, like I said, what I did with that kidney because the donor was 19 years old and she right. died in a car crash. So this 19 year old didn't get a chance to live past that. And I wanted them to know because I was only 29 when I got the transplant. 
So I was like, I just, that, that was my mission really is to let them know that yes, I would love to meet you. And I understand if you wouldn't want to meet me uh, someday, but I just want to tell you what I'm doing with this kidney. But like I said, I was sort of an addict when I was sitting home and about once a month, I would send them something. And every time I had a major accomplishment, I would send them something because you know what? I think even if they don't ever answer you, they kind of need to know that. And a lot of people don't even write the first letter, uh, the, the thank you letter. And that, that's okay. Cause I know not everybody can. I understand them. that. I what? Were you willing to get that to, to getting her yeah. to talk back to you? You said the right yeah. words, you know, the it. right uh kidney that love letter or or compassionate letter to get her to know, you know, that this was worth giving. You know what I mean? This was yeah. the gift, and I'm gonna show you yeah. what I did with this gift. Girl, I ain't mad at you. You ain't never lied. Come on here. Come on here. Okay. I just know that it was a okay. young man that gave me his mother's uh kidney who passed away of a heart attack and she was 55 years old. Oh. So, uh, oh. you know, so I was grateful for that. And I did, I think I must've wrote a poem, a song, a rap and everything you could think of to them <laughs> of thing. You know, sometimes you it know, is, I'm not mad to be and sometimes it, and sometimes it isn't. Um, I also sent them up. I had sent them a poem called my donor angel when I didn't know who it was. That was my first letter, but then I, I'm a writer. So <laughs> I wrote, uh, you, the things I wrote to them. Uh, I mean, I did the best I could. You'd think I was getting graded on an essay. Um, it was that special wow. to me. Um, basically. What a dope uh, so, network. Uh -huh. Live on New York. I'm sorry. The Donors Network had a, a celebration. And I remember the first year that I was going to be a year with the transplant. And they had a, a, you know, a ceremony for you can honor the people or honor, mm -hmm. honor donors and you know all of us together in one place in in a church nice. that they had in that that they were doing to go to that and that was some experience you know but you when you was you were doing the dialysis what two years you got the call About three years, yeah, what three was the years, first yeah. thing that hit you well three i ain't mad at you okay three years all right yeah three yeah. years you got the call yeah. what happened what, what what took place that day uh, I answered the phone and they said, there's a chance that you'll have uh, this kidney. My reaction, excuse my French, was holy shit. <laughs> That's what I said to the coordinator because I was just, I was kind of shocked because I had a pager back then. Yeah, no we, pagers. we didn't have cell phones. So it was like, okay, that thing went off accidentally. That thing would fall. And it was so many false alarms at this point. I was just like praying for the right God to give me the right kidney. And it was just like, I was just shocked. And then when I talked to her, she said, you're fourth in line for this kidney. Okay, fourth, uh, I guess I'll take it. What's that mean? So uh, that was fourth like, too. Oh, you go ahead. Oh, wow. Go number yes. four. <laughs> so yes. uh, Woo. Yeah. Yeah. move number four. So yeah, one of them uh, was pregnant. No, going to get the kidney. One of them was sick and I forgot what happened to number three, but Hey, number four was a charm. Uh, so basically, I had to call my family, called my father, called my employer. I'm not coming to work today. I'm not coming to dialysis. So the funny thing that happened was that my dialysis center, incidentally, didn't have enough blood work on hand to do the typing because it wasn't my dialysis day. So my wonderful, oh. uh, my wonderful grandfather uh drove as i guess kind of fast as <laughs> as he could and took whatever shortcut he could to pick me up um he was in his 80s 80s or 70s back then anyway drove me to the hospital and then had to we had to wait for the results to make sure that the tissue type matched because there wasn't really cross matching like they did um you know like the stuff they do now yeah, not like now um, right so mm -hmm. So we had to wait for the results and go home and wait like four hours until they actually told me that the kidney was mine. Talk about stress. Uh, I was feeling it. So I just ca basically called everybody <laughs> I could possibly nail, call huh? to, try to, uh, to try to get my mind uh, going and, you know, and off, off that worry. And uh, basically, when I was waiting for my grandfather to take me up there, I said, you got to hurry up. You got to hurry up. And the first thing my mom says to me, who lived with my grandma, said, wait, wait, daddy's got to put his teeth in. I was like, oh, geez, okay, come on. <laughs> so he drove me up, and then he drove me back, and then he drove <laughs> me up again. <laughs> and, you know, it was a family affair. Um, so basically, uh, I did end up getting, obviously, getting that kidney. 
the whole day was a blur but uh when i got transplanted but uh i i will say what i remember is a couple of things uh i remember when i woke up my father kissing the top of my head and saying um you did good and then basically i passed out from the pain medicine <laughs> but uh you know what that was hard <laughs> that i remember that you know that one moment and i know my family was there my parents were there and and, and people that you know that loved me so family support is so important no matter what um oh. i have to say that amen amen you're telling the truth. You're barking up the right tree. Listen, now say how long you had to transplant because nobody noticed, but you keep saying back then, back then. All right. Tell them how many years you've had this beautiful transplant. September 6th was 20 years. So now it's over 20 years. Woo! 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 That's all right. You rock. <laughs> That's, so that's something right. to God, total glory. Yes. So, yes. yes. You put something, I celebrated you doing this year. good, you know? Even with COVID, I celebrated very small. Uh, I got myself a cake shaped like a kidney with the veins and arteries and said, with the donor's name on my cake. <laughs> it was the best cake I ever wow. had. Local bakery made it for me. So uh, it was just me, my husband, and my aunt. And, I like uh, a piece of that. Mm -hmm. Oh man, if you like chocolate, man, <laughs> I can't really have it too often being diabetic, it. but you know what? For my 20th anniversary, I wanted a chocolate fudge cake shaped like a kidney <laughs> with strawberries. Wow, at least you got it shaped like a kidney. I would have had happy kidney versary, even though it was late and belated, but happy kidney versary. And that's, that's a beautiful honor uh, to have it that long. And, you know, now the pills you're taking before, how many was it? opposed to the pills you're taking now okay so this is interesting for everybody waiting for a transplant or newly transplanted because i was transplanted in 2000 so uh i was probably on 20 good 20 something 30 pills not all of them are for your transplant some of them are for the uh side effects to the anti-rejection medications some of them are to prevent you from getting uh mm -hmm. Yeah, getting other viruses and illnesses because they give you so much anti-rejection medication mm -hmm. at the time that your immune system is is lower, um, you know, than it normally would be. Uh, now, while I am still considered having a lower immune system because of transplant meds, I probably take well of three transplant meds um, as well as four pills for blood pressure. Uh, and a couple other things like stomach pills, cholesterol pills, and a hand, good handful of vitamins for the most part. So the number of pills I actually take that are prescribed yeah. are a whole lot less. Uh, I've self-prescribed certain vitamins for other things, cholesterol, uh, my, my macular degeneration, multivitamins, vitamin D, all the stuff where problems came up. I now prevent problems by taking vitamin some of these D. supplements, vitamin C, you know, all, all of that good stuff. But it's not like it was. I mean, you early on get your transplant meds lower. And now from what I've heard uh, from friends on here, they don't give you as much as they used to. I was even on a trial drug that was somewhat experimental uh, called rapamycin. Uh, and I was lucky to, that I was able to keep taking it because it keeps my psychosporin levels low. And psychosporin, if too high, can be toxic. If not enough, can be toxic to your kidney. Uh, so that's, it, it's a fine balance, these medications. And uh, like Lisa said, nobody's perfect. Um, if you say that you've never, ever, ever missed a pill of any kind, you know, I'm not really sure about that because 20 years out, yeah, once in a blue moon, I've messed up, okay? I'm human. People look at you and go, 20 years, wow, yeah, you look normal. You look, you look great. You don't look like you've ever been sick. I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> And yeah. that happens a lot, but I still have sicknesses and things that were effect from the transplant, not necessarily the transplant, but prednisone. Oh, my, my least favorite drug in the world. Oh. But, my, but, you know, it's great Please. for keeping the transplant, Please. you know. So, yeah, there's the osteoporosis and, you know, the diabetes from it. But you know what? Here yes. I am. I'm, I'm alive. I'm off yes. dialysis. So what, 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 what can I do? You know, preaching to the choir. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's right. I mean, I had 19 pills in the morning, 16 at night. I have four in the morning now and two at night. But I did develop, uh, yeah, osteoporosis, diabetes. I never had diabetes in my life, um, bone joint disease and everything. I'm used to running track and I'm still trying to run it. But then I had to graduate from a cane to a walker. And then now I'm trying to <laughs> trying to go backwards so I could get myself right again. I, I love, I, I don't mind. Because I just, I'm going in regardless. And, and so are you and the kidney warriors out there. We just got to keep on fighting, keep on moving, keep on supporting one another. Do what you, you know, can um, do. what I love about you, you you're on fire, girl. Huh? Hmm? I'm sorry, I said do what, you, everybody should do what they can do. Whether it's stand up, whether it's just move a little bit, even if it's a little chair yoga. If you can't do one thing, do another. It's better than laying down. Yeah. That's so true. Stay active as active as you can. You know what I'm saying? Now, you're in some volunteer. You're also involved in some other stuff. And you got an award, right? How old? I can't get it right now. Now, I've been saying this thing for uh, uh, two years now. And I'm now, now when I get on my show, I can barely get it right. But I like the owl. And I know you got him around here somewhere because even when you could, I see him. <laughs> well, I yeah, thought I saw him eating one time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm glad uh, you, you got that honorary award. So here's a... Uh... <laughs> I'm glad you got that honorary award. Tell us a little bit. Oh, there he is, the famous yeah, one. Yeah, he's like That's getting ready right. for Christmas with his hat. Book and everything. <laughs> yeah, mm. so... Uh... Wow. <laughs> Hal, yeah. Well, Hal is actually... Uh, what he was... Uh, and still is, is he's a recognition of, um, from Hal's heroes. He's a couple of things. First of all, I don't know if she's watching, but my friend Brenda Cortez writes wonderful books about transplant and Ooh, organ Brenda. donation. Yay, Brenda. Woot, woot. And uh, she's the creator of Hal the Owl and various books um, that people should really check out because um, they're about organ donation. There's And Brenda, of course, is a living donor of a kidney. So she's awesome to begin with. So she wrote these books starring Hal to teach adults and children um, for uh, everybody. I mean, Hal has one. Hal gets a new heart. So he actually has a heart transplant, which is pretty cool. Uh, where, wow. you know, as a character. I ain't mad at him. <laughs> and there's one Hal gets a liver. So he's kind of all set. And uh, Hal helps others with love. Anyway, she's got some great books. Oh, and Hal. Uh, and, so how, how was an award because he was a recognition in house heroes it was something created by my friend brenda and my friend jean syme jean syme is uh, a lovely person who lost her sister to covid19 who was an, and her sister was a nurse and she lost her sister this year and uh they created house heroes to recognize essential workers um who, who worked during the COVID crisis. And because of my work in mental health, uh, they gave me the HAL and the honorary part uh, membership to HAL's Heroes. There's a whole bunch of us out there and they continue to do this, which is just really sweet. I even gave my nephrologist one because, hey, those doctors were keeping us alive and I've known her so long. She said that was the best, the best honor that she ever got. So, because it came from a patient. She said, this is why I do what I do. So, um, yeah, so this, this is what, uh, Hal is, I mean, Hey, he's not a golden trophy, but he's gold to me <laughs> it, because important that's people beautiful. gave it to me. Oh, no, that's beautiful. Wow. Um, wow. Mm. Well, you, you, you do so much. Okay. You also, uh, are married and your husband also share in, and raising awareness. I love that. I had a husband that shared and, you know, awareness mm -hmm. with Important. me and had my back and support. I love that about your husband. Yes, we Share both are volunteers. Bit of that. I know he's well, not a camera person, but <laughs> presenting you both. But he's always commenting. And uh, so we're both uh, registered as volunteers uh, <laughs> with my Oregon Procurement Agency, the Sharing Network of New Jersey. Uh, so that's pretty awesome so that we can do different volunteering, uh, together and, uh, we can't wait to participate in the transplant games of America, um, in New Jersey. Um, this year they were canceled because of COVID, but they are now postponed to next year. 
So we're going to be involved yeah. in that. I'll participate. And of course, he'll be uh, my supporter and possibly volunteer with whatever he is able to do. So we're pretty excited about that. I really hope it can happen uh, next year. I'm, it'll be the first time I participate. I know other warriors out there have participated a number of times and achieved medals. I'm just looking to go have a good time and meet other transplant warriors of all kinds of different organs and their families. Um, people who are recipients and people who are donors can participate in the games. That's just totally awesome. And they're doing it in my state. So uh, this time for the first time ever. So I'm really thrilled. I'm so glad to hear that myself, that they have brought it here. I was sharpening myself, getting ready and everything, do whatever I needed to have to do. And when they canceled it, I understood, even though I was disappointed. And it would have been my first time because I could go for a minute. You know what I mean? So I was mm -hmm. glad this was it this time. And I was like, man. But so mm -hmm. I won't give up. So when they bring it, I'm definitely going to be there, too. You're going to see and me see running, see jumping, you. or doing something and like that. You know, so um, you just do what you yeah. can do and, so and have fun. And now, just do what you can do because life is worth having fun. Whether you're on dialysis, got a transplant, or you just got a kidney disease, is worth living. You know, I always say get tested, know your family history, and be educated about your illness. You know what I mean? So it takes teamwork to make dream work. Sharing is caring. So share this broadcast. Yeah, hard to that. But anyway, is there anything we might have missed or didn't talk about? Because I know you um, also deal with uh, eye, your eyes, and you deal with diabetes, as you said, you know, and, and everything. But you're just alive and kicking, my sister, alive and kicking, <laughs> you know. So is there anything, because I'm about to end the show, I let it go on a little longer because there's no show after us. <laughs> like, yes. So uh, I want to mention a couple of things. Uh, one of them is an advice I have about taking pills because I am the worst pill taker on the planet. We, well, except for my grandmother, who's no longer with us. Um, I wouldn't even take an aspirin growing up. Uh, swallowing pills, I have this thing where they don't like to stay down. Uh, so I don't know whether it was anxiety or whether it was just my stomach deciding it didn't like to take pills. So the first thing after I was transplanted, the pills went down and they didn't stay there. I was really nervous and start crying and said to the nurse, well, if the pills don't stay down, how am I going to keep my transplant? She goes, honey, you'll get used to it. They will eventually stay down. So my secret is this applesauce, applesauce <laughs> or yogurt drinks or anything. I, the stuff doesn't really affect my diabetes because I just use enough to swallow the pills. So anything that you can use that is thicker than water go for it and use it to take the pills if you're like me. I know there's a handful of people out there like me. I've heard it before. Because some of those pills you get, especially in the beginning, are huge. And the hospital will give you applesauce. <laughs> at least. That, at the very least, that's wow. what they have in there. Uh, they don't have the good stuff like pudding, but they will give you applesauce, and it's great for taking the pills. Um, if they didn't, I would actually like hide some. My husband would bring me some. But uh, that's, you know, just a little tip off for taking pills there. Um, I also want to say I like that, that. I like I yeah. like that you said that. No, um, wait a minute. I like that you said that because I years ago in my 20s, I had problems with taking pills. I couldn't swallow them. They never stayed down or they would get stuck here or choke me. So I used to have to crush them. And I mean, I tried some of everything to deal with the pills. I don't know when it happened, finally happened, and I was able to swallow it. But I mean, it took years. I had a phobia with it, too. but I had to take, you know, I wasn't on any medication before I was on dialysis. So, you know, yeah, I was pretty good, but, you know, so I'm glad so, you put it out there. So they want them to know. But what was your other thing? If interrupt. Uh, well, actually, I just want to mention something else about the pills. Um, something that people don't realize, too, if you tilt your head back like this to take pills, they're more likely to get stuck. I was actually reading a good article, and I found this works. Two things. Take a really deep breath uh, before you take the pill, and then put your head forward. It's strange, but the way that your body is set up, the pill will go down better than when you tilt your head backward. Everybody thinks taking a pill, you got to put your head backward. But for some reason, because of the airway, 
I don't understand what the anatomy, but I read something about this. It actually, as you take a deep breath <laughs> and you swallow the pill, putting your head down, it actually works better. Strange little thing. Uh, but that's what I found. You can oh. try it. Um, the you other know, some I, stuff you learn by habit. <laughs> yeah, I learned by doing. That was one I recently learned by doing, especially on those. I mean, you know, that throwing back. I mean, I've done that myself. I might have done that earlier. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Or to get it out of the little thing that we have to put it in, you know, the transplant little trade thing. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, well, yeah. Mm, that, that, and, those are good tips. You know, I'm sure there's somebody out there that probably would this type of thing. You know, um, well, uh, and who the, is it uh, that you would give a shout out to or anybody that you would like to either thank or address or say something about? Because I know you're a good woman you, you're not just a good wife but you're a good daughter and you take care of your parents and and i've known your mother uh was on dialysis and what have you as well you 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 just a hero by yourself honey so you know is there anything that you like to say or miss or add and uh, give that shout out to that special person out there that had your back uh the top people have in my back First of all, my husband, Tom Kirkowski, of course, uh, who's with me every day and helping me to stay safe from COVID by doing all the shopping and all that good stuff. Uh, and definitely my dad, <laughs> if you're watching, because uh, I know that if you're not watching it live, I can send it to you later. And I'm sure that you'll watch it like all the other broadcasts. Tony Ceruto. Daddy, I love you uh, so much. And um, my Aunt Rose, if you're watching too, Rose Palchi. Um I'd give a shout out to my mom, but she's in a nursing okay. home uh, on dialysis, I just, yeah. but I send prayers to her all the time, um, as well as to my aunt and my dad. So uh, anyway, that's my uh, my top people and um, prayers to keep my family, including my, my brother, my whole family safe, you know. Uh, shout out to Jean Syme if you're watching. I love you. Jen Benson, uh, you're, you're awesome. Uh, also, just want to shout out and say... Uh, I'm also going to be an advocate for Transplant Journeys, uh, Jen Benson's nonprofit organization. Also, going to be getting a person to be a mentor to. And I'm really happy about that because I think that would be a great experience. Uh, so, yeah, uh, shout out to mm -hmm. everybody. Patricia Stabler Yates, if you're on here. Um, anyway, lots of people because I've met wonderful friends here. And I want to say thank you, Urban Health, too, well, you because know, I've met great people. Well, we're a family, and we are we have our we're our own community and a family that's growing, and people are knowing more about us when they didn't before. I always say we were under a rock, and we just got to get from under that rock, you know. Um, there was something else I wanted to ask you or say, but now I forgot what it was because I got all caught up into your conversation about what you were saying. But I do appreciate. Um, oh, if there's somebody out there. They have a transplant, the transplant is trying to die out or something like that. Since you had just 20 years, is there anything you could say to encourage them or any tidbit that you did that kept it this long? Because we know about, you know, God doing all of this, but anything that he, he to help this kidney to stay as long as it stays. Yeah. Follow up with your doctors, take your medications as prescribed. And call your doctors if there's a problem. Even if you don't have an appointment, don't wait till your next appointment. Uh, communicate with them. Also, if you have more than one condition, keep your doctors on the same uh, page. One the biggest sign is the people same. don't do that. Is they don't keep the doctors on the same page if they got more than one. So they know what medications that you're on in case of an emergency. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things. Always keep a list of your meds on you. If you got to go to the ER, it saved my life once because I was um, out of it from uh, a side effect to something and my husband took me to the ER. Thankful I had a list of meds so my husband knew what they were so he can tell the, uh, the ER people. Uh, so you always want to keep a list of your meds so nobody messes up. You want to stay aware and ask questions if you go to the hospital so that they don't mess up because not that they're going to, but they're human. So they could. So, you know, or have an advocate with you to help you. I realized during COVID that's hard to do right now, but under normal that's circumstances, hard. that's what I did. So I think, you know, these are things that, wow. could, keep your, that could help you keep your transplant is, you know, to, to do these things. Exercise if you can. 
if you can't move a little, uh, you know, keep active, find support, uh, you know, talk to people, keep your mind busy, keep your mind active. So important uh, because then you won't sit around thinking about it. Uh, now, do I think about mm -hmm. it every time I do blood work? Absolutely. Do I worry every time I do blood work 20 years later? Absolutely. But you know what? It's okay. That's normal. I want to tell you that's normal to worry about your creatinine every month or two uh, months creatinine. or whenever you do that blood work. So it's okay. Hang in there. Call your doctor if there's problems or, or questions. Even if you're a little nervous, leave them a message or whatever. Just contact somebody, professionals, to find out. Don't always listen to everything you hear and see on the internet. And sometimes friends will tell you their experience, but it might not be yours because everybody's body is different when it comes to their medication and experiences, even on dialysis. I think that's important. Wow. Now that's powerful. That's some really good golden nugget. Come on here, Dawn. What? That 20 years done kicked in, girl. I ain't mad <laughs> at you. Listen, honey, I do appreciate you uh, being on the show. I'm just sorry that you're in person because I know you're a good cook and I'm just a teeny weeny bit hungry. All right. So I would have won a dish or something like that. I saw some pictures now. I saw some pictures. And I think the owl is eating a little bit too much. But um, I just. I just want to say thank you. I thank your husband for uh, letting you have this time and space. You know, some spouses are real tight and they don't, you know, but yours is, is, is a given and he's a beautiful person. So I yes. thank you again for being on. Yeah. Keep up the great work. Keep doing what you're doing. And you know me and you're going to stay in touch and tight. So uh, you have an excellent, fantabulous night. And You too, Lisa. Yeah. My pleasure. My you pleasure too, to meet you and be on here. My pleasure to meet Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See, guys, listen at what was that a great show or what? I just don't know what to say. You know, there's so many warriors out there with powerful stories. They're not only just on my show, but there are so many other shows on urban health. And now there's a lot of other people are doing more podcasts and more stuff. The more recognition, the better. This is no contest. We all one big family. I don't care what channel you on or what you're doing, but keep that awareness going. All right, because it takes teamwork to make the dream work, Archbishop Rock could always say. So God bless you. I love you. Next week, I'll have Christina, Christine Hernandez. All right, powerful warrior, a powerful, powerful warrior. And you better tune in to hear her story. I ain't mad at you. Good night. God bless. Mwah. Be for victory. Mm. <laughs>